Why yes, yes it is. It's a 1983 Mac CF611. After an entire year of doing this show, I finally get to hang out with a bulldog and cruise it down the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. This rig has a six cylinder diesel 260 horsepower engine with a five speed manual. It has a 1250 gallon per minute two stage waters pump and a 500 gallon water tank. This engine retired as engine 536 with the Terrytown, Louisiana Volunteer Fire Department, but was saved from a scrapyard in Mississippi by John Bones Early. It is now Early Fire Company Engine 91, which is the year that John started in the fire service. John retired from injuries he received on a structure fire from the Loudoun County, Virginia Fire Department. His line of duty injuries may have ended his career, but his passion for the fire service still lives on. Engine 91 is used at training events several times a year with the Middle Tennessee Fools and other Tennessee area fire departments. Hi everybody! Jesse Quinalti, welcome back to another episode of Firefighters and Fire Trucks Getting Ice Cream. I'm out here teaching at Firehouse Expo in Nashville, and uh, we're cruising around in a 1983 Mac. I'm going to go pick up Ben Martin from Embrace the Resistance, and we're going to go talk about leadership and some other cool stuff. So stay tuned. buddy <laughs> good how are you it's good to see you yeah want to get some ice cream yeah let's take a ride yeah this thing's awesome dude yeah we're, we're ready a lot of the older rigs oh this thing is this thing is prime it's a it's actually owned by a guy uh john early He's actually out from your area. He was uh, Loudoun County. Yeah, yeah, he was up there. Yeah, and uh, he actually got burned in that that big fire they had uh, in the burn ward for a while, and yeah, just oh, wow. uh, just crazy. Man. So. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to drive this thing, and uh, <laughs> we'll get we'll get going down the street. All right, here we go. Maybe. Come on, baby. So, how's uh, how's Nashville been for you? Oh, we love this city, man. Uh, my <laughs> wife came down with me, which is really cool. She doesn't right? get to make every trip, uh, but this is one place, and I don't know if it's the music or it's just kind of the culture of the city, but we just we really really enjoy it. Yeah. So, Whenever I speak, we cut out and it's day drinking and country music. That's, she loves it. She, we absolutely love right. it. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> that's what you get into right there. So uh, coming out here to Nashville, obviously you're here to work, but right. you know you got to play. What was the class you were teaching this week at, at Firehouse? So we did our intoxicated leadership class, okay. uh, which is always really exciting for me because, you know, as I've traveled, I don't really feel like anybody else is talking about this kind of stuff. There's people talking about uh, staying in control of your emotions for the, the physical side of it, like being able to make decisions under pressure. But when he talked about building relationships and actually influencing that environment so that you have more credibility with your people, Right. And helping them feel better about themselves and the job. Like, nobody's talking about that piece. So, it's, uh, like, I, it's hard to get people to come. 
come to a class about feelings, but once they're there, <laughs> they don't want to leave, which is really neat. So how'd you, how'd it come about with uh, getting into that, why'd you call it intoxicated leadership? So when you look at what happens to the body under stress, right, so basically it's the classic fight or flight syndrome, some of the side effects of that, besides the increased heart rate and the, the dry mouth, are auditory exclusion, where you can't hear things you would normally hear. And if you've ever ridden in the car with your wife and you're driving and you're thinking about stuff and all of a sudden she's like, what do you think about that, honey? And you're like, oh right. crap, like that's auditory solution. And then you get something called tunnel vision where you're focused on whatever you think the threat is. And most people classically think that's like a gun. But really, if you and I are having a counseling meeting, it could be a piece of paper I set across the desk. It right. could be the way I sit in a chair or whether I sit between you and the door. Like different people respond differently to that kind of like intimidation. Right. Um, so when you look at that and then you take into consideration that your working memory, which is basically your ability to process thoughts in the moment and make connections, I call it the if this then that, like you can actually decide what's coming next. Right. All that goes away. So what you get is a person, and this is true for the leader as much as it is for the follower, who doesn't remember the things they've said, will say things and do things they wouldn't normally do. And I was a bartender for 10 years and a bouncer before that. And I'm like, that's a drunk person. <laughs> so what I tell people is like, when you're experiencing high periods of emotion, whether it's a fire that you're going to that you don't want to screw up, or whether it's you've got a guy that's been giving you a hard time at the firehouse and it's time to have that talk, whether they become emotional or, or you do, like that's where leadership can really show up. Because I would no sooner ask you to chug a bottle of Jack Daniels and then be in charge of a fire, right. then I would allow you to come in really upset at your wife and then coach me. Because it's the same thing, but the right. body can't distinguish it. And what's really neat is the part of the brain that uh, deals with emotions is also the same part of the brain that alcohol influences. So there's really just this full 360 tie-in. Gotcha. Um, and I'd heard of toxic leadership, but I'd never heard of anybody talking about intoxicated. And you know this, you gotta have a hook. So right. like that just kind of became it. And the more that I've talked about it, the more relevant it really, really seems. Um, like yesterday, I had a, a lady come up to me, and this is actually the feedback I get more than anything. And she says, I wish I had the class a year ago because I just got divorced from my husband. And she's like, in everything you're saying, because what we do is we teach people to read the situation with the other person like we're looking for signs for flashover. So they obviously the idea is to cool the environment before you burn. The same thing. And she's like, that's exactly us. Everything you said, that, that's how it progressed. Right. Um, and maybe she'd still be married if she had the class. So, like, it's really powerful. This idea of investing in relationships obviously has application at work, but it also matters with friends, loved ones, kids, you know, that kind of stuff. So now, as you've been teaching that class here and there and, and uh, kind of messing around with some stuff, now you built the website, you're cruising around, and, uh, and now it's come to a, a bigger problem uh, of embrace the resistance. Right. <laughs> so it, it's funny, man. When I, I started as a, in a formal leadership position about eight years ago as a lieutenant, which is that frontline supervisor position in my organization, and I was an idiot. I don't know why I thought being right and having rank would be enough to get people to buy in. Right. You know, and then you can tell people that the earth isn't flat, but there are going to be people who just challenge that. Right. And my first year went really well, and then my second year was a disaster. And uh, I had a guy that was going through a divorce, and that's really where I saw the quality of our relationship deteriorate. Because no matter how empathetic I thought I was being, I just couldn't understand what he was talking about. Right. So as I'm going through this, and I'm trying to do the right thing for him, and I'm getting killed in the rumor mill because his side of the story is getting out, and I can't talk about it because I'm his boss and it's not right. proper. Uh, you can imagine there was a lot of resistance. <laughs> and I was teaching those lines to uh, recruits one day. I was flowing water, and one of the things I had noticed is that whenever I would actually train, it was always a nice distraction from whatever was going on at home. 
Right. And about the time that I was going through this nonsense with that guy, I started having problems at home as well. And you better believe at that point, I'm like, I get it now. Like, I get why this guy comes to work and doesn't have 100% bandwidth to give me or this job because I feel like I'm a mess too. But I have to do something because I'm the leader. Right. And so as I'm flowing water and I'm trying to explain to them nozzle reaction and how we can plan for it and how we can counter it, I shut the nozzle down and I said, you know what? This is this makes me think about what I'm going through right now. Right. I can shut this nozzle down, I can do nothing, and this hose line is easy to handle. But everything else around me gets worse. I'm like, and that's leadership. When you make a decision and when you step up, like, I don't care what your definition of leadership is, but it's gotta involve making decisions. And right. people are gonna disagree with you, sometimes passionately. And if you expect that and you consider that, maybe it helps you develop a better approach. Maybe it helps you decide, hey, you know, why don't I go get some stakeholders involved in this? And it's not just my decision. And there's so many different ways to bring buy in on something. And so uh, I just went with the race resistance. And I was, I was like, you know, we can take this nozzle off and flow the hand line. There'd be no nozzle reaction, but it would be a mess to, and you couldn't hold it. It'd be completely ineffective. And right. instead of giving you that reach and penetration that you're looking for in your organization, you just have wet feet. And so I just kind of ran with it, and it, it just it probably sounds like politics more than anything, but it, uh, that's right. just kind of what it's been in my heart, and that's what we've gone with for the banner. Well, and you figure, yeah, it's the, the weird thing about, you know, leadership, when you start talking about that, it, it's all about influence. Right. You know, that's what it means. Right. So being able to influence those people, like you said, getting the buy-in, right. otherwise you can say you're a leader all you want, but if you turn around and there's nobody following you, right. then really are you the leader, you know? Yeah. And you just have to go different routes sometimes. Different people are not going to latch on yeah. to, hey, maybe this is what we need to do. you got to kind of come from a different angle, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's the classic conditions drive tactics and tactics put out fire. Okay. People drive tactics. Right. It's, it's going to be different for everybody. Sorry. And, um, you know, one of the other reasons I started the website is when I was going through these challenges, I couldn't find anybody talking about it. Like, you know, there's all these great books from all these legendary fire service leaders. And all of those were things you should do to reach success, but none of them talked about, like, the stumbling blocks and the pitfalls. And then the biggest thing for me was, am I crazy? Like, am I really, am I the only one in, this, in the world going through this challenge? And it turns out, right. hell no. Right. I'm like, my experience like is fairly unique, but at the end of the day, it's still not all that unique. Right. Uh, so I wanted to have a platform that people could come to and, and check in and go, all right, well, maybe I'm where I should be on the learning curve of leadership, or maybe I'm behind, or maybe I'm in front of it. If I could start people out six steps in front of me by publishing my mistakes, then that's awesome. Like, right. that's totally what I'd like to do. Um, there's no need in making those same fundamental mistakes, so let's move past that. Well, and I was talking about it with somebody else, you know, you, you have to have a network of people that you can contact and bounce stuff off of, you know, and yeah. uh, somebody in your department and, and outside your department. Somebody yeah. that doesn't know the players in the game, you know? Yeah. Well, and, you know, the, the more the conflict or the situation involves you, that's like you having a handline on the interior, right? So you can, you can make a big difference at the point that that's seen the fire, but you've lost all awareness of what's happening around you and whether the right. exposures are heating up. And so having that outside perspective is like having that battalion chief outside, letting you know that yes, what you're doing is working. Right. You know, I see white smoke or, hey man, you're getting ready to lose <laughs> the building. You need to get out. Right. Um, or maybe, hey, I know you want to go in there, but that's not what I'm seeing out of my experience. Right. And the more we do this together, the better it is. And, and that's what I, I think the other thing I've seen, and you talked about influence. So if leadership is this thing where I get promoted and then I tell you what to do, like, am I really influencing you? Right. Well, maybe. Like, maybe I've got some good habits that you pick up on and incorporate and do it. But, like, I think that about the people that have made the biggest difference in the way I lead, and it's the people I don't respect. It's the bad leaders. It's not the great ones. Like, I have great ones in, in my life. Right. But the ones where I've made the biggest leaps forward have been from working for bad leaders. And so I don't want that to be me. Right. Like, I, at all. Uh, nor do I want a situation in which I show up to work and they do what I've asked and is expected, and then they don't when I'm not there. Like, that's not leading. Right. That's managing. And I don't want to be a manager of people. I, I want to lead. So that's really where you have to demonstrate patience and empathy and even compassion. Uh, 
And I really think that is, in its truest sense, the brotherhood that we talk about. And I think that's why I see, especially on social media, like, where's the brotherhood gone? Right. So that's it. That's it. You got leaders that lead with rank and title, and they don't consider their people. They, their egos are in the way of themselves. And, like, that's what I want to get rid of. And, uh, and so that's why I'm so passionate about traveling and speaking and writing and all that stuff. And the cool thing about it is I get to meet people like you and Steve and right. like, there's always smarter people. So I just take a little bit of, of that and go back and I try it. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't, then that's okay too. Well, I don't know if I'm smarter, but I still get to hang out with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Well, is, you know, we talk about the, the strength of the fire service is the company. It's right. the backbone, right? And so why leaders feel like they have to do things by themselves, that's completely counter to the company concept. Right. You know? So... I let people have a say in things at the firehouse as well as on the fire ground, and the conditions drive how much say they get. You know, if my bosses have told me we've got to storm the mountain and the only way is side A, then I right. got to rally people behind that. But if they said, you know, we got time, we need to storm the mountain, and figure out a way to do it, then that's a wonderful time to come back and circle the wagons and be like, what do you guys think about this? And what's the history behind this? And right. What am I not seeing? And um, reaching out to peers and, and, like you said, out, even outside the organization. My best friend's uh, officer in the Coast Guard, pretty high up. And, you know, that's where the uniqueness comes in. Like, I say stuff, and he can put a name to every story I've got. <laughs> right. And so a lot of times, he's he's ahead because he's ahead of rank of me. And the advice that he gives me is like, oh, yeah, it makes complete sense, man. You know, there's a reason we respect him and firefighters. And I think the same thing is for leadership. You know, at the point of engagement, that's where you get your experience, not on the sidelines. I know plenty of leaders that are popular. But they don't do anything. Right. They don't stand in the way of their guys. They let the guys do whatever they want to do. And that's great if, if it's what they should be doing. But if it's not, it's completely counter to the mission. Uh, I've worked with leaders who, like, on the year might have recorded 10 training hours. Right. Their guys love them because they love sitting watching Netflix. Right. Um, I mean, when you can clear an entire season of Breaking Bad and one duty hey, day. Hey, whoa, 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 right? whoa. I'm oh, quiet. you're saying that on duty day. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Duty day. <laughs> That's not effective leadership. But right. wildly popular guy. And so like, right. it's trying to figure out, you know, is popularity necessary? No, not at all. Now, and we talked about this in the class yesterday. It's important how people feel about you. And I would say so. I mean, and if you think right. about the people you respect, they probably make you feel pretty good. But more so, I think the evolution of that, because you're not always going to make people, uh, you know, like you. It's just not going to happen. Is how do you make them feel about themselves? Right. You know, and if you can reach them and they like coming to work because they know you're going to invest in them and train them or challenge them or give them boundaries, and like that's a relationship that somebody would want to have with the boss. Yeah. And what's well, cool about that is they'll model that moving forward. That's how we fix stuff. <laughs> I always consider myself an empowerment style a leader, you know, let them do what they got to do, you know, but it's not the same as letting them do whatever they right. want to do. Right. And I think a lot of times, like you said, we get that confused. It's just like a good leader as a good instructor, you know, if I'm teaching an instructor class and I ask somebody, hey, give me an example of a good instructor you've had or a bad instructor. Doesn't matter which one, just give me an example and what made them a good instructor? And you'll get these guys that it's like, well, this person is a good instructor. Well, why was he a good instructor? Well, because he was funny. Yeah. Okay, well, what did you learn out of that class? You know, is that really a good instructor? Yeah, and I'll tell you, man, that's that's prevalent in conferences, too, where you'll go and you'll be entertained. Right. And I, I've laughed my ass off in classes, but when I left, it's like, all right, what three things that I learned that I can apply? And I don't, I did not have it. And I'm like, right. well, am I trying to be educated or entertained? And I think there's a blend. I think oh, for sure. Um, you know, I, I tend to laugh at myself more than anything because I think, <laughs> you know, I want people to be able That's because you're funny looking. Stop yeah, looking in the mirror. I already told I you. I know, I know. Just getting the hairline. <laughs> just, I can get it to just chill out and stop headed towards the back of my head. I'll be good. It's regal. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's regal. Like that. It's sophisticated. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, there is a fine balance. You know, obviously, you, you, you can't be monotone and, and dry, but, you know, there's there's got to be some content there. It's got to be well-defined and, and laid out. And yeah. uh, and I know you're out there around the country doing that, which that's that's why you're here hanging out with yeah. me today, you know? Yeah, it's, it's cool. You know, I 
know, and the thing that I say to anybody that's watching this is that could be you. If you have a message and you're willing to put yourself out there, right? It, it could be you, especially in today's digital world, right? Where and I would love to see people who have the right message for the right reasons get this opportunity instead of the people that are seeking to glorify themselves on social media, right? And critique others and like the social media pirates, like it's just oh, like enough of that already, right? Um, but yeah, you can do this. Oh, and there are people in my department that know way more than I do and are a way better leader than I am. They're just not willing to put themselves out there yeah. outside of our organization. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just I, I, I want to have more impact than that. That's just what's in my heart. Right. Well, and how long have you been really like hitting it hard now? You know? So really only three years. Yeah. I've been doing the Embrace Resistance for four. And the first year was hearing no all the time, everything. And then the second year, uh, it actually started with Firehouse Expo, and then it was Firehouse World, and then it was MAPSI, and then it was uh, the Teeks Leadership Symposium, and then it just kind of like opened up. Right. Um, and then it was FDIC, and then FDIC again, and then FDIC again, and so that's that's been really really cool. I mean, it's just such I'm such a small fish in a big pond, but I'm so <laughs> glad to be in the pond. Like it's right. just really really cool. It's yeah. Really really. Cool. And yeah, I, I met you at, I think at Virginia Beach the first mm -hmm. time teaching out there. Yeah. I mean, it's, and you were just getting started yeah. and, and getting really <laughs> into the conference world. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, but it's much harder than it looks. It really oh, for is. sure. To, to fit your message in a 90 minute time slot or a 60 minute time slot and allow for questions, but not allow for too many. And that is tricky. Right. And relating it to the group. That's also very cool too. I knew he was coming this way. That's right. I saw you driving. And I, I think it's important to, like, you know, you, you've got, um, you've got an older guard of tenured guys that speak on leadership or tactics. And right. I always think about who fills that gap behind them. Right. You know, you don't, never replace them and it's just like the fire service where you're building off of their work and what they've done you know nothing's original and right? everything is you right. know, a version of a version right um, and I hope to be in that group and there's a there's a lot of guys you know like Jerry Sergi and Mark Malone and mm -hmm. um, you know uh, Josh Kramer and I mean, there's so many good guys that right. have great messages that are just getting started too so it's yeah I love hard. Jared Jared is just fantastic yeah. it's just good stuff very, very good. But well, it'll be neat to see, uh, you know, in five years to just glance forward and see what that looks like. And, <laughs> right. You know, are we talking about feelings in five years or are <laughs> back to full control and no autonomy and all that BS? Well, and it's funny when you start, you know, like Jared, he's got, you know, some military background and you were talking about your buddy in the Coast Guard and all yeah. that. And a lot of times when we thought, like, look at leadership, we always refer back to the military, you know, and we're, we got to remember we're a paramilitary organization, right. but where did that leadership in the military come from? You got to remember when you see all those cool movies and all that kind of stuff, it's because they were put in positions right. that they had to be a leader. You're talking about death and destruction and all kinds of stuff like that, where in the fire service, you might not always get those opportunities to like, Man, there was this big fire, and yeah. I commanded it, and that's what's my leadership ability. Yeah, you got to find just the opportunities day to day to back up your people right. and yeah. totally. and do that. Totally. Yeah, you're right. Like leadership's very romanticized, where you know you see these big scenes in movies, and you're like, I want to do that. Right. And then you realize it's more like chores, it's like it's little things. It's making sure little things get done every day, and then it's really so much less about you being on camera than your guys. Right. And it's cool when you've got a shop where guys want to step up and they've just been dying for a leader that is willing to put their ego aside and what they think they need to do to get noticed and elevate their people. I mean, and that's, you know, unfortunately people don't see that. But that's what needs to be done. Right. Um, we always talk about leadership and rank, like formal rank, as a cheater ball on a halligan. Right. So, <laughs> if you work with that Halligan bar every day and like you're passionate about forcing doors, 
and I give you a cheater bar, which is then that, that rank, you're going right. to blow doors off the hinges that much faster. Uh, gotcha. Right? But if you've never picked up the Halligan bar, because it's not something you're interested in, it's not your passion, and I give you a cheater bar, you won't know what to do with it. You're going to be looking at these two pieces like whatever. And that's leadership in the fire service. When I get the guy that takes the time to work with the rookie on DPO, or the girl that takes the time to work with someone on their acting officer book, or, you know, the guy or girl who just really shows up every day looking to make their peers better, right. I get that guy or girl rank, game over. But when I screw it up is when I give it to the person who, the flash of the pan, all of a sudden they got really interested and took the right classes and knew the right people, but right. that's not who they are. And maybe they grow into it, but I doubt it. And I don't ever think they'll reach the potential of the person that was messing with that Halligan bar every day. Right. So that's what I look for. When I see those people, I'll do anything for them. Well, on the, the future. on the opposite, oh, sorry, I'm on a hill. <laughs> on the opposite end of the spectrum, using that rink as a cheater bar, like you didn't have enough leverage before, but now that right. you got rank, you're using that right. as leverage, right. you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and so, you know, use it to continue that uh, metaphor, what you've got is, like, that formal rank will also allow you to say, I may have this cheater bar, but we're actually going to go and make this inward and outward, and we're, that's how we're going to force this door. Right. So there are definitely opportunities that present themselves to formal leaders. There's no doubt about that, right? And the responsibilities that you're given with formal rank do open doors, but it's not a requisite at the, at the basic fundamental level of, of what leadership is, in a humble opinion. So you, uh, once you got the uh, Embrace the Resistance blog going, right, that that was really just bouncing stuff off of people at a bigger scale. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so I started, uh, the first article I ever wrote was about uh, legacy versus impact, where I had fused the two. And so the premise of the article was, I'm neglecting my family to pursue something I really, really love, which is the fire service. Okay. And we talk about creating a legacy in the fire service, but I don't think that's it. I think the goal is to come to work every day and have a positive impact. And when you leave this organization, your impact is left for the better, but your legacy, which literally by definition is a gift, you know, the way to navigate the world, the values in which to do it, like my children, that's, that's where the legacy comes from, right? right? And you see this, you know, I worked on a big project um, and I dedicated two years of my life and I was really proud for that. And I was staying up to like 3 a.m. working on it, getting up at 6 a.m. and like I had a deadline and it's been wildly successful, but I'm not in charge of it anymore. I haven't been in charge of it for years and nobody's gonna remember in 15 years that I was one of the founding people working on it. Right. We're just gonna have the benefit of the program and it won't even be my program, it'll be iterations of, of our program. So, my girls, very different story. I mean, every day that I'm not there and every hour that I don't spend with them, it, it matters. So, I wrote that and it was a very long article and uh, Kurt Isaacson picked it up, which was really, really cool. And, and he said he felt the same way about it. And I was, I was like, you know what, I wanna write more. And, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to write, but I just wanna write more. And so I started writing stuff and submitting it, and I just couldn't get it published. Um, right. It was too long. Everybody wanted articles that were like 300 to 500 words, which is like page. And I just couldn't. I talk in stories, and the first page was the story. So I couldn't get to the learning points in 500 words or less. So eventually, after striking out for about six months, I decided the best thing to do was start my own page which means I don't have as much visibility as I'd like to have, but right. it's also been really neat building it from scratch. Uh, really, really cool. I went the other day and they're almost at 50,000 views on the website, which for three years I think is pretty neat. Yeah. We don't do advertising. And it's all word of mouth. And, um, like I said, I'll be interested to see in five years what it, it looks like. Well, it's, it's always one of those cool things, you know, just to see, you know, new instructors coming into the, the conference circuit and having an impact, you know, and uh, like I said, met you at Virginia Beach, Bobby Drake, yeah. you know, some of those up and coming instructors that are that are just getting in there. And uh, it's it's been really cool to see. There's there's a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, we obviously know, you know, the Sulkas like I interviewed last month and, yeah. and, and Billy G and stuff like that. But I always say, you know, hey, if you've seen Sulka once or twice, 
No offense, you're gonna hear the same stories. Yeah. Go hear something else. I, I'll hang out with John anytime. I totally get it. But you know, these the new up and comers hanging out. You know, and I, I knew when I first started this show, I'd get to you eventually. You know, we we always <laughs> teased about it, and Bobby yeah. Drake is the same way, dude. I'm like, I I, dare, I guarantee you, I will come find you on the show eventually. <laughs> And uh, it, it def definitely worked out having you out here and, and uh, being able to spend time with you, man. So I really appreciate it. Oh, no, I appreciate that one, too. Can't turn down a ride in a fire truck and ice cream. <laughs> Especially, I, I didn't think I was going to be able to get a fire engine for this episode. We were we were looking all over the place and, and nothing. And it's never been this hard for me to get a rig. And then this one came around. And he's like, it's a 1983 Mac. I'm like... Really, yeah. I am sold, dude. That is, yeah. that's awesome. You can't get any better than that. All right, here we go. Get some ice cream here. Have you ever had ice cream before? Uh, once or twice. <laughs> 